Hi there, welcome back to the Maritime Business Veterinary Technician online review course. Uh, we're continuing on with parasitology, which is in the third, technically the third module. Um, and this is the second par parasitology lecture. So the definition, these are all the same definitions that we had on Parasitology 1, the first lecture, where we talked about nematodes. So again, just to make sure that you review these, it will definitely help you understand these PowerPoints. So um, again, this was also shared on the other PowerPoint, PowerPoint, sorry, about parasitology. There's different categories. There's nematodes, which was on the other PowerPoint. Um, there's also cestodes, trematodes, arthropods, and protozoans, which I do believe are covered in this PowerPoint here, the rest of the four. So let's start with cestodes. So cestodes are what we call tapeworms, okay? So there's one intermediate host tapeworm, uh, which is Dipalidium antinia and Echinococcus and uh, Monesia, I do believe that's how it's pronounced. You'll Please excuse my pronunciation on these parasites. Um, but those guys need one intermediate host, and then there's also some that need a two intermediate host tapeworm. Typically, we deal with the one that has the one intermediate host. Um, there's larval stages, which are more pathogenic than the adult stages. The adult stage provides eggs to perpetuate the species. So typically, the adults aren't very harmful. They can actually live in the intestines quite happily and cause no side effects. It's the larval stages that are more pathogenic. The life cycle is always indirect, so one or two intermediate hosts. It doesn't matter. It's, there's always going to be a middleman when it comes to tapeworms. Domestic animals are the definitive um, host or even sometimes the intermediate host. Transmission it can either be by ingestion of the larval stages or uh, ingestion of cestode egg. So the anatomy... Um, they're multicellular with no body cavity, unlike the nematode that did have a body cavity. Um, the body itself, there is a head with suckers on it, um, and then a body, which is composed of a whole bunch of segments, and those segments are actually called proglottids. So each proglottid um, will break off of the end of the uh, tapeworm, and that's what's shed. So proglottids near the head are the immature proglottids, as you can see in this picture. And then as you move down progressively down the tail, they um, become more sexually mature, where those um, those further down proglottids um, will be gravid, which means that they, gravid is another word for pregnant. And uh, so they contain um, what's called hexacamps, which are actually eggs. And then, um, so they shed those proglottids and within those, that's where the eggs are located. So um, let's talk about those hexacamps or those eggs. Um, gravid pro proglottids may contain um, developed embryo with six hooks in three pairs uh, or a zygote that develops into ciliated embryo. The most common tapeworm found in the small intestine, um, most common tapeworms are found in the small intestine of dogs and cats. Dogs and cats infected by ingesting a flea with, um, I'm sorry, we're talking about Dipalidium caninum. So Dipalidium caninum, the intermediate host is the flea itself. So the way that a dog and a cat gets Dipalidium caninum is by ingesting that flea that has the, um, the larval stages, the infective larvas, larval stages inside it. So the gravid proglottids found in feces and on pet's hair coat and bedding. So um, that's where you're going to find the segments of the tapeworm. Just like in this stool sample, you can see that there's some proglottids there. And uh, a lot of, it's, it's not uncommon to find these segments around the anus of the pet. And if they're all dried up and shriveled, they look exactly like sesame seeds. Um, as far as uh, tenia, um, there's different types of tenias. But uh, these guys, um, the intermediate host is typically a rodent, okay? And um, so in this case, um, pissi Tinea pisiformis is the rabbit. Um, and then the, there's others for ruminants and, um, and then one specifically for a cat. Nonetheless, intermediate host is there and it's usually a rodent. Oftentimes you'll see it with, uh, with mice and um, rats being the intermediate host. So this is what microscopically those eggs would look like within the proglottid. Um, you can see the suckers on the mouth of this tapeworm. 
And then we have Echinococcus. Um, these are tiny tapeworms. They only have three proglottids, that's it. Whereas the other ones have, oh, gosh, it looks like hundreds. Um, there's one immature proglottid, one mature proglottid, and one gravid proglottid. So the definitive host primarily is dogs. They harbor the adult stage of the tapeworm in their small intestines, just like every other tapeworm. The intermediate host is typically sheep and cattle, and they harbor, they harbor the lar larval stage of the tapeworm in a variety of visceral organs, like their livers and lungs and their brains, um, and, and that's where they'll harbor that. So it's very important when humans are eating this to make sure to cook their, their meals really well uh, if you're eating any of the viscera from these, from these animals because they may be harboring that infective larval stage. So a kind of caucus and how it can affect humans, you have to be careful. Um, this is, uh, the picture up here is, it's quite disturbing. They um, can develop a hydatid cyst uh, disease in humans, and that's what you can see here in the abdomen of these patients. They have the echinococcus tapeworm, and that's what it does to it. It can also develop um, these cysts in the brain, which is quite traumatic, as you can imagine. These are tapeworm segments, so if an owner brings in these segments to you and they're looking to see what's going on and what it is, um, you need to be able to let them know that these are these are proglottids. Um, you can see over to the right, they're much more dried up and shriveled and they look like sesame seeds or they can look like grains of rice. Um, if you want to determine the exact species of the tapeworm, you can rehydrate these segments by soaking them, and then you kind of squish them down on a microscope slide, and the eggs will squirt out of the proglottid, and um, and then you can determine which kind of tapeworm it is depending on what the eggs look like. Um, it, I, typically, it doesn't really matter what species of tapeworm it is. Tapeworm is all treated, no matter the species, with the exact same drug. So, but just make sure that you know that this that you're able to recognize these tapeworm segments and know that the treatment is quite different than your typical roundworm. All right, moving on to trematodes. These are unsegmented flatworms. So um, trematodes, there is digenic flukes, which are flatworms, okay? Um, di um, digenetic, sorry, digenetic is definitive host uh, they're going to have a definitive host plus two intermediate hosts. They are unsegmented and leaf-like. Their organs are embedded in loose tissue. They have two muscular attachment organs, um, a sucker in a mouth and a ventral sucker as well. They often infect the GI and sometimes the respiratory system or even some blood vessels in their definitive host. Typical flukes are the paragon uh, paragonimus, um, which paragonimus in uh, cats and dogs, the schistosome, which is in wild birds, and uh, the schistosome fluke is actually what causes swimmer's itch, and then the fasciola hepatica, which is the liver fluke in um, larger animals. So here are trematodes here and a website here to help you get familiarized with them. Now, schistosomes, which are a type of fluke, um, aquatic migratory birds are the primary definitive host, and humans just happen to be the accidental host for this zoonotic skin condition. So um, aquatic mi migratory birds are the ones that are going to carry this schistosome, and then they're going to place it in um, areas where humans are swimming, and humans will inevitably get swimmer's itch. So they live in the blood vessels of birds, but on the skin of humans. So when they shut down lakes in the summer months because of bacterial issues, it's often because of schistosomes and uh, contracting this parasite causes swimmer's itch. Um, the female parasite lives within the long, deep grooves of the male body, which is very strange. So the female lives within the male. The eggs passes in feces into water. Eggs hatch, enter the aquatic snail, and um, asexual reproduction produces motile swimmers, and they enter aquatic birds, and that's how it's transferred. Moving on to arthropods. 
Arthropods are parasites with jointed appendages or feet, okay? So um, even a spider is an arthropod. So it has like a spider eight legs and there's jointed appendages. But the ones that we're gonna talk about are the ones that affect our uh, common domestic animals. We're gonna talk about sarcoptic scabies. We're gonna talk about autodactyl cynotus, demodex, chylotiella, um, trobicula and ticks and stenocephalids, which are fleas. Let's talk about them. So sarcoptic scabies, which is often termed as just scabies, it's diagnosed by, superfi by superficial skin scraping on a glass slide containing a drop of mineral oil. So we talked about how to do skin scraping. So you scrape away at the superficial skin, put it on a slide, and then you should be able to see this little guy underneath your microscope. Um, at the end of some of the legs is a long unjointed pedicle uh, or a straight stalk with a tiny sucker on it, which is really gross. So that's scabies. Excuse me. Autodectes cynotus is ear mites. Okay, so we all know that ear mites. They uh, it looks like there's coffee grinds in the ear, and that's when you that's the typical appearance that ear mites will have in our cats and dogs, just like in this picture down here. And then you'll take a cotton swab, swab it out, smear it onto a microscope slide, and put it under the microscope, and this is what you'll see here. This mite here. Demodex, um, you would do a deep skin scraping. So you scrape, uh, you do the skin scraping until you actually have bleeding and uh, you look at it under the microscope and this is what you're gonna see. They are non-contagious. They're um, normal inhabitants of the skin and hair follicle actually. So pretty much all dogs have this, um, but can cause significant skin disease if immunocompromised. So if the animal does become immunocompromised and doesn't keep these guys in check, um, they can overpopulate and start causing disease. They have a very unique morphology. They don't look like any other mite. Um, they're carrot shaped, as you can see here. They resembled an eight legged alligator almost. And, um, and uh, yeah, this is also a contagious demodex mite. Um, there is also a contagious demodex mite, sorry, called uh, demodex gatoi. Chylotiella. Uh, is often termed as walking dandruff because just like on this skin that you can see here, those white flecks will actually be moving and that's the actual mite itself. So it causes intense pruritus. Puppies and kittens and humans um, can all be affected, but it's less intense than rabbits. It's highly contagious and um, you need to do topical and systemic treatment. So we just do a skin scraping, place it on a microscope slide, and this is the little guy that we're going to see on our microscope. Uh, trombicula, which is um, which is often called chiggers, and these are for warm-blooded animals, both avian and mammalian. They have a parasitic stage, a six-leg larval chigger, and uh, they feed off of the skin and then drop off, um, but they don't burrow in. After dropping, they molt into a free-living eight-legged nymph, and uh, you need to treat this with a therapeutic shampoo. So when we do a skin scraping, this is what we'd see. They're probably the scariest of them all. They look like they got hair, like they're hairy. Ticks. Um, there's thousands of different types of species of ticks. They affect most every species of warm-blooded animals, um, mammals and birds. The important vector for tick-borne disease. So um, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why we worry about this parasite or this ectoparasite is because it can actually transmit Lyme disease, which can be fatal. So um, in this picture up here, you can see there is a tick there. I think there actually might be two ticks, a uh, smaller nymph, which is a younger tick, and then one that's been feeding for a while because it's quite engorged. So um, we just have to be careful when we remove these guys from the skin that we don't keep leave their head embedded in the skin because it can actually cause an abscess. And then we have fleas. So um, everyone knows what fleas are. They affect dogs, cat, horses, rabbits, ferrets, and many other species. Uh, humans will come onto us and bite us and realize that we're not really the best meal for them and then they'll leave. Um, but they will infest dog, cats, horses, rabbits, and ferrets. Um, one female flea can lay up to 40 eggs a day, which is quite impressive. If you look at this uh, animal here, there's obviously a lot of fleas going on there, and you can imagine each one of them laying about 40 eggs a day. That could produce uh, about 1,200 eggs in just one month, which is unbelievable. And um, if your dog has 20 fleas on him, which is not uncommon, 
in one month they could produce 24,000 eggs, which will all hatch into fleas in about 30 days after um, the adult laying the eggs. So infestations can happen really quickly and we have to, it's, it is worrisome. Um, they're not only a nuisance, but they can also cause flea allergy dermatitis in animals. So um, it is concerning and nobody likes to see their pets with fleas. So. As far as the flea life cycle, uh, the adult will lay the eggs, the eggs uh, will hatch into the larva and the larva and the eggs reside in areas where the animal will lie. So um, on their beds, on your couch, on your bed, if your animal sleeps on your bed, in the, in the cracks between your hardwood floors, they just find any kind of dark area. And um, they live there for a little while. These larvae will actually feed off of the poop from their mother that's dropping down into the environment. They will eventually pupate and turn into this little cocoon and then they will hatch into um, an immature flea and then make them make their way into an adult. It's very important to understand the life cycle of the flea. Our common preventative drugs and treatment options involve controlling different stages. For example, sentinel acts as a birth control, okay? So we'll still see those adult fleas, but they're just unable to lay eggs that are going to be able to hatch into um, other adults. Whereas revolution is a flea adulticide, so it, it will kill the adult. And, um, but I'm also pretty sure that the revolution also is an oocyte as well, so it'll ki kill several stages. Okay, moving on to protozoans. Protozoans are single-celled organisms. They um, typically aren't considered parasites because they are single-celled, but they do have parasitic tendencies, um, so they're usually classed in with a parasite. So um, they're unicellular, and the ones we're going to talk about is Giardia, Coccidia, Toxoplasma, and Cryptosporidium. Giardia. Humans and pets are affected, usually comes from contaminated water. It's also called beaver fever, and um, usually when swimming in contaminated lakes or stagnant water, you'll um, contract Giardia. Cysts and trophozoites can be seen on direct smear. So this is a cyst over to your left here, and then right in the middle and to the right, you will see those are the trophozoites. So those are almost, you could say, the adult stages. And the first picture is the cyst itself. Um, and with a fecal flotation, you can see this. The centrifugation method is better. Um, they're very challenging to see. That's why most uh, why IDEX came out with a snap test so that we wouldn't have to rely on our eyes to find it microscopically, but the test can tell us if they're positive. Um, the next one is coccidia. Uh, coccidia is a very, very common protozoan seen in our domestic animals. Um, especially from animals that come from shelter situations. Very, very um, infectious, so it spreads from one animal to another very easily. It causes extreme diarrhea, weight loss, and dehydration. Can actually cause death if it's left untreated. So, um, but it can be treated, and in healthy animals, sometimes when they get uh, coccidia, it, it resolves itself on its own, and you don't need treatment. But a lot of puppies get this, and, and they're really seriously affected by it, so we do have to treat that. And this is what they'd look like microscopically. Much easier to find on a microscope than Giardia. Toxoplasma. The definitive host is the cat, but others can be intermediate hosts, or um, that should actually say um, accidental hosts, like humans, for example. So only pose a risk to the fetus of a pregnant woman if she is infected for the first time, okay? So if you have been exposed to toxoplasma before in your life, you've developed a resistance to it, uh, your body can just take care of it. Even if you're pregnant, you don't have to worry about it. But if you get exposed to toxoplasma during pregnancy, it will cause major fetal defects. Um, um, so very important, and you get it from cat feces, right? So very, that's why they tell pregnant women not to change the litter boxes. So the cat itself will be asymptomatic, which is kind of tricky, and then they'll pass it in their feces, whether it's in your garden or in their litter box, and you have to be careful not to ingest it yourself because it can, um, it can be transmitted to you. It's also, um, toxoplasma can also be found in cysted in meat or undercooked, uh, in undercooked meat of different farm animals. Cryptosporidium. 
It's the largest protozoan parasite in the GI tract. It affects all domestic animals. The tips of the villi and the small intestine is where they're going to be found. Um, it is diagnosed on fecal flotation, and there is no reliable treatment, unfortunately, for cryptosporidium. And there's a website here that you can view.